title for our sermon today is A Child Shall Lead Them. So if we can just bow our heads together, we'll have a, a short prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, and uh, you know better than anyone uh, how nervous I get when I'm up front, God. I just pray that you would remove that from me, that you would speak through me to uh, to everyone here, even um, the very message, just tailor it this time and and teach me uh, what I need to hear as well as those that are, are seated here as well. So um, we thank you because you are able and we know that you're always willing to help. So uh, we pray for this and your blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. So <clears throat> thinking about all generations, I know that most of us will be able to think back. If not, maybe you still experience it to this day, uh, whether you're older or younger. But walking into social settings can be quite a nerve-wracking ordeal, right? Especially when you're younger, right? So uh, when we think back to our adolescent years, when we're teenagers and we're going through puberty and all of these changes that are taking place, Usually, it seems like all eyes are on you. And sometimes, we still, even though we're older, can have that happen. We walk into a new scenario. We walk into a new setting. And we don't really know anybody. We feel a little out of place, maybe awkward, insecure. And that is something, if you don't relate to, hopefully you can picture in your mind. Now, as we think about having people come and visit here in church, wanting maybe uh, younger, you know, there's great, there was a whole row. I think there was like, you know, 10, 11, 12 uh, young people here, uh, part of the church family. It's always nice to have young people. And we are reaching out to young people, young families. So just in your mind, Try to imagine and picture those same feelings, that experience I was just describing of most of us in the past. And now that's the experience of a young person, whether a teenager, young adult, maybe young family, walking into church. I had all of those emotions raise in me after having Nova, because as a young family, um, when your child makes a noise, everyone knows it. And usually, it means you're going to try to um, at least calm your child down a little bit, right? Usually. And, uh, and so, that means not only are all eyes on your child, but all eyes are on you as a parent. And, uh, and so... When we're picturing this, this new young family walks in the door. Maybe it's a young person, as I said. And then you have individuals, whether or not it's true, they feel like people are staring at them. They feel like people are, are looking. And sometimes that actually does happen. We stare without maybe greeting. We uh, realize that there's a smell in the air. It's a different smell, right? Whether we know what that smell is or not, you know, it could uh, alert us to stares. It could make an individual start to feel even more insecure and uncomfortable than they already do. And the more that this sensation is felt by the young person, by the young adult, or the young family, what happens is it's like a wall that is being built. A barrier starts to thicken, and each time that they approach this church family, maybe after that first experience, they have the gusto, they have the, the <laughs> courage to come back. <laughs> and if we want them to continue coming back, we need to try to reduce or break down walls rather than thicken the barrier and build walls up. So with a young family coming in, if there is a, a noise, maybe 
somebody would lean over and whisper right at that time. Maybe somebody is going to glance. Maybe an individual is going to give harsh stares and, and silence with a hush. All of those things will actually increase the insecurity and increase the barrier for that young family ever wanting to return. Um, you know, being able to have a smile, uh, being able to have an understanding look, being able to gesture that they're more than welcome to, uh, to have a seat or if they needed some help, those are all things that would be encouraging to break down walls and encourage someone to come back. As we are discussing today, a child leading, a child leading us, being able to step back into time, maybe reflecting and remembering the way in which we have experienced life when being younger, um, this can open up a little bit of a dialogue for how we should relate to children currently and continue to, to learn how to relate to young people better. Um, we're going to be going through a number of, of uh, scenarios or a number of accounts of history in the Bible together. I won't be referencing the exact places just for time's sake, but there will be a couple times that we'll be able to flip in Scripture together. So, um, trying to understand what part does a young person have to play in our church for today a way that we can understand this is by looking through and seeing how young people in history have played a part in God's movement. So Joseph, taken as a slave, we know how old he was. He was um, 17 or 18 because we know he rose to power, it specifies as in Scripture, at the age of 30. Now this is amazing because he was second in command of the largest empire at the time, Egypt was the largest empire at that time. And so he would be in a position like uh, Mike Pence, like for the you know VP, Vice President of the United States, or maybe uh, Julie Pay um, Payet, right? I think is how to pronounce her name. I don't know. So uh, that's our <laughs> governor general. It's easier to pronounce Pence for me. But uh, so either one, they're second in command of a country. And it would be like... Um, having one of one of um, the young people today that we know of, I'm 33, so um, we see like somebody younger than myself being in second in command of the largest empire or the largest country or most powerful country on the planet. Moses, he was very young when he made a mistake. We know he killed a man trying to do his own thing, trying to expedite uh, God's will. And yet God didn't hold a mistake from his past when he was young against him, still allowed him to lead. Now, you know, when he actually was called and took the calling upon himself to go back into ministry, he was 80 years old. Now, sometimes we think to ourselves like, oh, you know, but 80 years back then, that was a young man because everybody lived forever, right? So, uh, but the fact is, actually in Psalms, there's a song of Moses that is uh, written down in Scripture for us, and he says that the general time or lifespan was 70. And if you live to 80, then that's a blessing. That whole passage, we sometimes, because it's in the Psalms, we think David wrote it, but it was actually Moses that wrote that. Um, that in a psalm there. So we know that 80 was considered to be an older individual. Now, he lived to be 120. So because he lived much longer than most today, people do live to 100, 110. You know, a lot of people on my mother's side lived into their hundreds. And so um, we know that he, he went in, we can just safely say it would be like any one of us after we have been retired, to go into active full-term ministry, right? Uh, just being able to be fully involved after retirement, okay? So uh, that would be the case for Moses. And he led for how many years? 40. 40 years, right? So um, that was definitely... Um, a feat to take on, but we know that God called him as well as called uh, Joseph, young and old. 
So David, he rose to power. He was anointed. It was thought to be anointed as an early teen. And he rose to, to power as king at 30. Now, he wasn't just a 30-year-old, you know, just on his own. He had a bunch of mentorship. So we know that Samuel and Nathan, two prophets, right, would have given mentorship to him. And even we could see he learned a lot of mistakes, what not to do, when he was in the, uh, the meeting, like tent, or it wasn't the tent of meeting, but the, um, the quarters of the king when Saul was in power. So he was able to learn from Saul's mistakes as well. Now, I'm going to blaze through a bunch of these accounts after I gave a little background there. So Joash and Josiah were both kings of the nation. One was eight, the other was seven when they rose to power. These are children now. Nahum's slave girl. Now, she would have been uh, very, she was in the least, a position of the least amount of authority in her time. She was a foreigner, she was a slave, and she was a woman. And so here we find a young woman slave in a foreign land serving underneath the commander of the Syrian army was able to be used by God, this young girl. So male, female, older, younger, all are called. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we know by their Babylonian names. It's almost like they were put into, when they had captivity, they had something that they, a special ministry that we have today. It's called public campus ministry. That's essentially what they were doing because they were a part of a Babylonian university. They were being trained and well-groomed to be like a wise man uh, for the, the nation or the empire of Babylon. Jeremiah was a priest and called to be a prophet while he was a youth. And we know this because he states, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I can't speak, for I am just a youth. But the Lord said, don't say that you're just a youth, for you shall go to, to whomever I send you, and whatever I command you to speak, you'll be able to speak. Don't be afraid of what they look like when, they're, when you're speaking to them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. So we know that uh, here, Jeremiah, priest, prophet, called when young, um, and we have many accounts of how young received mentorship, as well as the older being called and not having their younger years held against them. So if that was the case, I wouldn't be a pastor right here before you all because I was arrested four times. So if we held that against me, I definitely wouldn't be serving God any, any time uh, near now or near in the future. So we're going to turn together uh, to Samuel, 1 Samuel, we can turn there, and as we get there together, we're going to start off in the first chapter, being able to understand the background of, of how Samuel came into ministry and leadership, learn some principles of how we can apply this to us as a church family relating to children and youth today. 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 23 and 24. All right, and if you're there, you can say amen. Okay, all right, enough amens to go ahead. So, we got uh, 23, verse 23, and it says, And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, this is Hannah's um, hu uh, husband, and so it says, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. So the woman stayed and nursed her, her son until she had weaned him. So what's going on here? We know Hannah was barren. She uh, was crying in front of the, the, you know, the tabernacle. She was crying in front of the tent of meeting there and just uh, petitioning God for a child. So 
as uh, as that was happening, we know that uh, priest approached her. They had a little bit of misunderstanding as to what she was doing and why she was there. And God answered her prayer, gave her a son, but she dedicated that child. She dedicated the child she would be given to the Lord. Um, so when did this child go into the Lord's service? We find there, verse 23, it said, up until he was weaned. Now, verse 24, we'll read there. Now, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bowls, one ephah of flour and the skin of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. So it emphasized this. The child was young. How young? Let's just say, you know, it still happens today, um, right? Sometimes, and probably more so it happened back then. The child would have been breastfeeding until about the age of, let's say, four or five, right? Now, it doesn't happen as often. We have supplements and different things that we offer children much uh, more readily available, and they didn't have all of those things at that time. So here, a child goes into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. That was the main center of worship during the time of Samuel at the age of four or five after he was weaned. I don't, I don't say that um, somebody was uh, continuing to breastfeed much longer than that in that time. Can we be agreed on that? It doesn't say four or five, but we'll say around four or five, okay? So that's quite young. We continue here uh, to chapter 2, verse 11. Chapter 2, verse 11. All right, so here it says, Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, uh, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Okay, so here um, the child's brought forward to the house of the Lord. Hannah, you know, has this beautiful prayer and, and like poetic uh, prayer that she has, and then leaves her her child, her son, with Eli the priest. So Eli is filling in as like a parental figure, a father figure, mentoring this child in the service of the Lord. And what it says there, it says that the child ministered, what, ministered to Eli? What does it say? M ministered to the Lord. Ministered to the Lord. Now a child, four or five years old, ministering to the Lord. This is something to keep in mind. Now, we'll also continue verse 18. Jump down to verse 18. It says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, and then it emphasizes in Scripture again for us, even as a what? A child. Ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. Now, why is this important? What was an ephod? It was specifically garments worn by who? Priests. It was worn by priests. So back then, um, we would equate priest or prophet type deal to somebody in a position of authority, such as a teacher or a preacher, a pastor, being able to give guidance and minister before the Lord and giving guidance to those that are seeking the Lord. A child wore a linen ephod, ministered before the Lord as a young person. And when we say young, very young. So now we have here <clears throat> verse 22. And with comparison in verse 22, it says that Samuel was very young, even a child. It says, and Eli was very old. <laughs> Eli is very old. And he says, heard everything his sons did to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Without getting into any explicit detail, basically, we know that um, Eli, later we'll find out, reprimanded for his parenting style. He was not restraining his children. 
he was not giving guidance or discipline. Now, discipline isn't punishment. Discipline's not a bad word. Amen? Discipline's not a bad word. The Lord disciplines us. That's why we're his disciples, right? It comes from the same word. So, so we find here that uh, here we find that Eli had another opportunity to raise somebody in the service of the Lord. Amen? See, his children... They uh, might have seen the influence, they might have seen the example, but they were not receiving the guidance or the direction. And so God had grace and mercy on Eli, I believe. And many times we can as well. Maybe it's through a niece or a nephew. Maybe it's through a granddaughter or grandson. But we have an opportunity. Is There's times loved ones, ones that are very close to us, have chosen to reject what we believe with our whole heart is the truth and the best for their lives. But that doesn't mean we still don't have the opportunity to give guidance still today. So this is what Eli had the opportunity to do, giving guidance to those that were younger in his influence, put there underneath his influence. So we find in verse chapter 3, verse 1, and then verse 7, this is... Uh, this is going to get very interesting. I find this to be one of the most interesting pieces that we'll be talking about today. Okay? Then the boy, Samuel, ministered to the Lord before Eli. So Eli giving mentorship, but he's there ministering to the Lord still. It says, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. What does this mean? This is talking about a revelation, something being revealed miraculously by God. It's called special revelation. And then, so messages being communicated by a human agent, a person. This is a prophet. There was no prophet during that time receiving messages, special messages for God to the people. They haven't heard the word of the Lord spoken other than the scriptures from the past. They hadn't heard it in a very long time. Now, Let's look at verse 7 together. Verse 7 it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. I think we could easily skip over this. And scripture is written for our edification. It's written to teach us, guide us as God's children. And I find this verse is packed full of, of uh, opportunities for us to learn uh, how to relate to children and youth. Okay, This verse here shows us that Samuel did not have a relationship with God. Isn't that crazy? Okay, when it says, did not yet know the Lord, the know is like intimacy, relationship. That, uh, that's the same word that is used, yada, in the Hebrew. Same word is used for uh, intimacy between husband and wife. It's the same word, as you read in, in Jeremiah, used to describe God's ex, uh, relationship towards us and how we should have a relationship back towards God. That word, no, is meaning relationship. Samuel did not have a relationship as of yet with the Lord nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. So he wasn't a prophet. He wasn't receiving special visions or anything like this yet. He didn't even have a relationship. Why is this important? Because if we're trying to break down walls, if we're trying to not widen a barrier so that when a child is old enough to make their own decision, they choose not to show up, right? Right? Um, we want to make sure that when they walk through the door, they want to come back. They feel like they are needed and appreciated and welcomed. This verse can help teach us about that. They, no matter what age we are, it, there is no prerequisite to serve the Lord. And there isn't even the prerequisite to know the Lord before serving him. I just want you to see what, what happened. Samuel was where? How, how many times do we see? About three times said that he ministered before the Lord, right? When he, before we then see 
Samuel did not yet know the Lord, yet he was serving. Yet he was serving. Sometimes we put restrictions. We put restrictions, right? So we have something called open communion. I'm not sure if you guys know the difference. Closed communion in uh, different denominations mean you have to be a member. You have to be a member of that church in order to eat the symbol, eat the bread, and drink the symbol of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. Seventh-day Adventist church doesn't have closed communion. Open communion means there can be any stranger that walks off that street and we still allow them to break bread with us. This is the truth. This is allowed. We don't say, oh, oh sorry, sorry. You can't, you can't have some of that bread because you're not one of us. No, that's not how it works. In our denomination, we do not have closed communion. Funny thing is, you can find these things, by the way, in the church manual if you want. So um, if, uh, if we have a child, though, they've been raised in the church, sometimes, now it might, I'm not saying it happens here, but sometimes what I've seen happen in churches say, oh, no, 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 honey, you can't have this. No. Oh, but that person that walked it off the street, we don't even know them, they can have it. But you can't have it. You can't have it. No, no, no. Right? What is this doing in the mind of the child? They're not accepted yet. They're not accepted yet. Okay? So here, we find that there's different traditions and practices that we've done over time that we don't even mean to. We're so intentional sometimes to make God holy that we make him wholly unavailable to the younger generation. Okay, So we need to be able to have it done in a way that makes them see that, you know what, no, you are willing to participate. Them singing up front like this was beautiful today, right? Special music was beautiful. Being able to have a scripture reading done, beautiful by a young person, right? Being able to show that you can serve, you can be involved. Somebody that immediately comes in off the street and is like, hey, can I, can I get up there and play guitar? And well, no, first, you, did you do the Bible studies yet? Okay, if we were to take that approach, make sure that you uh, don't get upset at anyone other than yourself if they don't come back, okay? So here, sometimes we can put those barriers without even knowing that we're doing it. So um, when there is a young person interested, excited, maybe they're doing it for the wrong purposes, maybe, but in the process of ministering to the Lord, we can step in as Eli's. Amen? We have an opportunity, whether we've messed up in the past like Moses or not, we have the opportunity to minister to the person interested or walking in today. And we can mentor. We don't say, well, you're not ready yet. No, you can't do that yet. First, you have to study 28 beliefs that sometimes I don't even remember off by heart still, even though I'm a member and studied at one time. I can't explain some of them anymore, but you have to know it before you do this and this and that. Okay? Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. If we realize that we are supposed to be growing together, all generations serving the Lord, mentoring and learning from one another. That will be an atmosphere where a young person and a young family and a child will feel appreciated, accepted, wanted, and be willing to continue to serve when they have the choice. So this is what we find from that. I, I found that very enlightening. And we find now verses 20 and 21, verses 20 and 21. So with this approach being taken, it says, And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. As we serve, as we serve, we can be drawn into a closer understanding of who God is, and God can then call us to even higher purposes. 
not you have you first figure out the higher purpose, you first receive the ordination, and then we'll allow you to continue serving, right? You're not actually a pastor yet until you have the doohickeys on your shoulders. I have them, by the way, um, the doohickeys. But, um, but that should never, you, we should never look at somebody differently because they don't have those things in place. Because they don't have certain fundamental beliefs memorized yet or they they don't have even though it's a beautiful thing and i still would love to learn all 66 books off by heart it shouldn't be a prerequisite to do those things right and i'm not saying it is but this is something when we function as a church family when we set up youth ministries and children ministries just keep those things in mind because it's something that can be so easily done. And, uh, and so when, uh, when we see here, verse, chapter 4, verse 1, I wrote, wrote down the wrong one here. That's okay. Um, we see that in this account, what established Samuel as a prophet? What established him? Where all of the nations knew. He gave a message to his mentor. He being a child, right? It says that he was a child. He being a child approached Eli, who's what? Very old. And in their culture, their tradition, it was different than the way that we have ours today. Now, in the generations coming, um, Sometimes it's gone in the opposite uh, swing of things where they don't mind how they say or how they act at all, no matter what your age. Commonly interpreted as disrespect for your elders, right? So um, it can be seen that that is now a bent or a swing that there's not really too much respect given no matter what age you are. But in that, in the the Middle East or where we find, uh, you know, Israel and all of those areas in Africa right below and even where, uh, you know, my wife's from Korea, but Asian countries, you still find this prevalent, what was in their day. You do not disrespect your elders. In the story of Job, we find that the youngest remains silent until all of the, the basically the whole book of Job was written of dialogue between older individuals and when they were completely finished then the youngest person in the book of Job decided to speak and was willing to speak see that is the type of environment Samuel was in God says Samuel I want you to go to the very old Eli and I want you to deliver a message to him there hasn't been a prophet in your land for a very long time, but I want you to tell him that he's a bad father. And I want you, I want you to say that there's consequences for not restraining your children, and they're going to die. Imagine, that would be a very hard message to deliver. But what do we learn about that? We learn that a child can be given divine impressions. They can give us guidance today. And maybe they haven't had as long of a relationship with God as you. Maybe you might not even believe that they do have a relationship with God yet. But they have an opinion on how things can be better in the church family. And they even think that something's messed up. Man, I, I feel like there's a bunch of hypocrites, they might say. I know I used to say it when I was younger all the time. One of the excuses why I didn't come to, come to church, right? But when we hear those things, what do we do with them? Do we dismiss them because they're a child? Do we dismiss them because they're disrespectful? Do we dismiss them because they are not actually members and don't have a vote? So who cares? Let, it, let the decisions be made by those that are older and wiser. 
if we don't give our young people a voice, then they will not feel like they even matter, right? So here we find that in these things, in this story, very common story that we've learned, I, I was amazed when God was teaching me as I was reading through this and the principles that we can discover from God's word when we actually diligently seek him, not just for a personal relationship, but how we can problem solve today. And there is a problem in our church family and many denominations with youth and young adults not wanting to be apart any longer, right? We find, why is that? Why is that? Oh, well, it's because they're just not spiritual anymore. They just don't care. Um, Oh, it's because of those video games, right? It's the technology, right? There's many things that we can think of. And we say, but maybe we need to spend some time seeking the word of the Lord as to how we can solve this issue and see if there's anything that we have set up on pedestals that are actually tradition and not law, the ways that we relate to those that are younger. Now, um, I'm going to just give a couple suggestions, not suggestions, a couple examples. That was the meat there, if you wanted any meat. Hopefully you, you didn't think it was the milk, because uh, so you can uh, pray about that. Obviously, it's challenging. Obviously, it's challenging. It's not an easy message, and here I am, younger than most today, delivering a message that probably isn't easy to swallow. So I understand this, but this is not to be uh, critical or judgmental. I'm not here to condemn. I'm here because I truly want to see our church as it was at the beginning. And at the beginning, we find even though there were many older individuals in the Miller Wright and Adventist movement, Ellen White was 17, James White, this is when they were in leadership and giving direction, James Wright was in his 20s, J. N. Andrew was 17, Stephen Haskell was 19, became a Sabbath keeper at 20, uh, J. N. Loth- Lothborough was 20, And he had already been preaching in other denominations for three years. So at 17, he started preaching. Uriah Smith uh, was a believer in 12 during the Great Disappointment and rose up to be a predominant leader at the age of 21. Joseph Bates was considered to be an old man. He was 35. And we find uh, that John Harvey Kellogg, at the age of 12, being mentored by James and Ellen White, knew how to run the entire publishing business at the age of 12, John Harvey Kellogg. Now, how sometimes we limit the abilities of our young people, don't we? Sometimes we believe you're young, you know, um, and that's a, that's a big matter. Business meeting, making decisions on how we're going to use our money is a big matter. But you know what? John Harvey Kellogg, 12 years old, knew how to run an entire business at 12, right? So we find that... Uh, Let's not try to put limitations on age, whether old or young, right? Um, and so uh, we, we can go through. There's many others. And uh, a great example for us when looking back at the history of the Advent movement in our church, a great example is the fact that all of those leaders served some of them up until their dying breath. We know that... Uh, Unfortunately, Uriah Smith had a stroke and died at 70, but he was on the way to the publishing house to continue in ministry when he passed away. And uh, up until A.T. Jones was 73, Joseph Bates, 79, Ellen White, 87. And this is when they served until, right? This is when they served until. And so uh, one thing that we should keep in mind with the service or ministering to the Lord is it should never be viewed as paying dues. I've paid my dues. I've done that. Now it's time for someone younger to pick up the torch. Oh, yes. Oh, well, I did that for years. Well, too bad. We don't have any young people. I know when I started, I was young. Where are you now? That's putting somebody in a box. It's it's obligating them to serve. It's saying, I've done it. Now it's your turn. I don't enjoy it anymore. I'm tired. I'm tired. (laughs) You do it. (laughs) Um, When we take on that mentality, it's not too appealing. 
it's not too appealing to take on. It's actually, they're like, well, I have a choice. I'm not in it as long as you. Oh, my, I can see that you're not happy doing it. You can't wait until you give it up. I don't think I'm going to get a part of this, right? It easily can be seen that way, right? So if we treat it as a prison sentence when we're serving the Lord, then that's how the younger generation is going to view it too, right? Now, these people were uh, joyfully serving, and it's not because our youth today are not looking for something to be a part of. In BC, there was an article a while ago. You know, the greatest amount of people, a part of a movement that's taking place, it's called ethical veganism. Now, I know there's vegans within the Seventh-day Adventist church. Ethical veganism is not the same thing. It's a little different, right? So uh, do your research on what that is before jumping to the bandwagon and, and getting on board. But all I'm saying is whether or not you feel you're an ethical vegan or not, this is a movement that is separate from Adventism. Veganism and Adventism is not synonymous, right? So we find that um, it's a movement that is happening. I know friends that are atheists that are ethical vegans. And when they are involved, they put their heart and soul into this. They put everything they have, protesting, standing up for the rights of animals, right? Now, we have, it's a movement. We have the Advent movement. We had young people because the ethical veganism is primarily young adults. That's the primary movement. Millennials, people that we say have no interest. Actually, they do have a big interest in things that matter, but they no longer see why Christianity matters. They don't see it as a movement going anywhere. They see it as stagnant and dying. And so because of this, we find that this, this group, this whole generation is looking for something. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for purpose. They're looking for a reason to stand up and do something. If only they had as much desire to spread the message to save individual souls. We don't know. It's not an internal soul, but beings, their whole being, who they are as people, saving them because they know that Jesus Christ is coming soon. How exciting is that news? It's ex they're just as exciting standing up for a, a turtle that has a straw in its nose. And, and why don't we give them something better? Because we have it. We have it. We have the greatest movement that they can be a part of. But sometimes we have lost the fire within ourselves. Sometimes when they look at us, they don't see us as a movement. They see us as as just going down instead of going up. They don't see the excitement or the desire. They don't see why it's even anything that matters. So to end off here, uh, it's not just Old Testament. It's not just the pioneers. We know Jesus selected many disciples, apostles. The youngest, John, was a teenager. Isn't that amazing? A teenager laid the foundation of the Christian church and it's lasted 2,000 years. Wrote Revelation, wrote three epistles, wrote a gospel, right? Now, he did all of those things when he was older. He did. But he did those things, and he served. He went out two by two. He was casting out demons and healings and preaching, and he was, he was doing all of that as a teenager, leaning on his, the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper, right? At the chest just leaning up against him. Here we know that Jesus called the old, the young. Mary, mother of Jesus, was known to be about 12 to 14. 12 to 14. Which that's how young, right, she was. That's true. That's how young she was. It, huh? Yes. So 12, yes, <laughs> I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, well, from research, I guess, if it was different, then we can discuss that later. But 12 to 14 is the, it was teenager years that uh, she was called. Now, she wasn't as old as Elizabeth, but uh, Elizabeth actually was advanced in years. The whole point is that one was called when she was young, and another was called when she was old. So here, older or younger, whether you're older or younger, we know that God has a calling placed on all of your lives. And so, um, yeah, so Jesus, 
Sometimes we picture him with a beard, which ages people. I don't grow facial hair. But, uh, so, but he was exactly my age right now. So I am 33 and a half years old. This is an accurate reflection physically, not spiritually necessarily. This is an accurate reflection of what Jesus would have looked like when he died for your sins on the cross. Right? Young person. Jesus was a young person. I'm still considered a young adult. And he gave his life for the sins of the world as a young adult. So we find that God has called each one of us, as the scripture reading said, sons and daughters shall prophesy. We know old men or young are going to dream dreams or receive direction from God. We know that men made servants, no matter what the socioeconomic class, no matter if you feel like you're poorer or richer than some, they're all called, we're all called. No matter who you are, male, female, young, old, rich or poor, we're all called. So as we, uh, as we think about the future, we know that there were examples, many, and I've only given uh, a few, because there's even more, of, uh, of how God has directed the church in the past. And I believe if we forget how he's directed in the past, we know that beautiful quote, right, then, uh, then we have a fear of, of doing the same mistake over again in the future, right? So, so we should try to remember, we should be able to focus on all of those things um, as God has directed, he can still direct us today. So as a child shall lead them, it's actually not talking about a child giving guidance to people at all. It's talking about uh, it's uh, it's talking about the new earth. It's talking about uh, the new heaven, the new earth, and it's talking about a child in in Isaiah eleven six. It's saying that a child will be safe enough to guide what we know as even the most ferocious beasts. He will be able to give guidance. He will be safe and secure. And are we? creating an environment for our youth, young adults, our children, even the youngest nursing child, to feel safe, be given responsibility to guide and direct like a shepherd, and all at that time will have the knowledge of the Lord. So may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. All right, let's just bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we... um, just thank you that you are a God that you, uh, you don't look at the outside. You don't look at either how frail and weak we are or how young and vibrant. We don't, you don't look at uh, any of these things. You look at the heart. And you look at the, the potential in which we have that you've placed upon our lives. So um, we, uh, we just pr- pray that you would be able to guide and direct each one of us, that you would inspire us to serve you and, uh, and do it for the right purpose, do it for the right reason, that you would help each one of us be a guiding presence to those that may not know you yet and that we would be able to all serve together as your family and be able to grow in love together. We pray and thank you for all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 